everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I am so excited to talk about my favorite topic again with a repeat guest, uh, Brian Carr. Brian is a second generation indoor environmental consultant who specializes in working with hypersensitive individuals with complex medical conditions. He's the kind of uh, environmental specialist that we like to work with because a lot of times um, in this industry, we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, it's hard to find the kinds of remediators like Brian and his company we inspect that really understand how sensitive some of our patients are and uh, and really go to the lengths that are needed. And again, we'll dive into all that today. So if you are suffering from mold-related illness or have had a question about maybe mold in your home or workplace, we're going to talk, we're going to get into the details today with Brian. Um, he helps uh, patients, clients understand if mold, mycotoxins, or other indoor pathogens exist in their home. And we'll talk about all the types of things that can exist um, and the things that can contribute to health conditions. As you know, from hearing me talk, a lot of these things are invisible and we were just talking before we went on. So often patients are like, no, there's no mold in my home. So we're going to talk about like why you might be missing the source of your health condition. Brian has become a go-to mold and biotoxin resource for many, many medical practitioners across the country and helped over 5,000 hypersensitive individuals worldwide to create healthier living environments. Brian is a co-founder of We Inspect and an expert at identifying indicators of mold growth, including but not limited to strategic sampling, validating and developing remedial strategies for mold growth and biotoxin production in all areas of the home or building, including walls, floors, ceilings, crawl spaces, basements, attics, and HVAC systems. Welcome, Brian. Great to see you again today. That is so long. I got to fix that. <laughs> That is out of control. I'm surprised you even got through all that. <laughs> no, you know, I'm the same way. It's going to read the Bible. I'm like, oh my gosh, please shut up about me already. <laughs> I know. I'm just like, yeah, and, and here we go. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's my no. bad. I got to get that fixed. But hey, thanks for having me. I'm super excited. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so we have talked before, but let's just give a brief background. We all have a story. How did you get into the mold remediation business? So we're actually not in remediation. So we're in inspections. Um, and it's like a super common like thing to confuse because everybody kind of thinks of it as the same yeah. thing. It's very, very much not the same thing. And it's a good place to start kind of. Perfect. Um, actually, I'll start with what you asked and then I'll go into that. It's so okay. my background, <laughs> so I have a story like a lot of other people do. Mine didn't involve me getting nearly as sick as a lot of people do, but it involved some health reactions of things that were going on. Basically, I lived in an apartment building in LA. There was a leak in the ceiling of my apartment building. It almost fell on top of me while I was sitting in my, oh my. bed. My computer. I dove out of the way, falls down, had this massive thing, the pipe of, for the bathroom upstairs. And um, long story short, I'm working with the landlord trying to get it figured out. And then, you know, they get somebody in there to look for mold. And they're like, oh, there can't be mold. We dried it now. There's no mold there. It's fine. Everything's fine. In the meanwhile, there's still big old freaking water stains on my ceiling. They didn't even like paint it. They didn't like it was like that's how bad it was. Months go by, time goes by. I start having symptoms, right? I start not being right. I first like I'm not as quick, like I'm pretty quick witted and stuff, and I like I wasn't as quick. And then like just like all these things that happen. And then one day I wake up, I go in the bathroom, and I have like eczema, psoriasis, whatever you want to call it, on my face. I'm like holy crap, what the hell is going on? So. Luckily at the time, my wife, who I was dating at the time, uh, her dad is like one of the best well-known guys that does this in the whole country. Um, and she connected me with her dad. He came over to my place. He was at my 800 square foot apartment for about you know, four hours or something. Um, found that my ceiling issue, it might've been dry right around where the problem was. But what happened is when water hits a horizontal surface, it goes sideways. It went all the way across my ceiling, all the way down all four of my walls. Oh, you were in a, a I cave in a box. of mold. <laughs> I was in like a mold, a toxic mold box, basically. Oh my goodness. Sleeping wow. in it. And I was like all this stuff. So he basically figured that out. He found a couple of things in my apartment. And I was just kind of blown away by how that went and the just significant difference between like, you know, local inspector Joe guy and then like and then like this guy who's like a nationally like, like this guy knows what he's doing. Um so I just kind of got connected with them. I loved it. I asked him on the spot if I could work with them. Wow. Uh, just because I felt like, I don't know, I just felt like I had to and fast forward and here we are. And that's kind of it. 
Unbelievable. Yeah, it takes a, a very unique perspective. And my medical stuff, it's curiosity for helping the patients get to the root cause. But in your place, it's the same, same skill set, really, this curiosity to go a little bit deeper. So we could go so many directions. But one of the things I would love to start with is that clinical visit. I'm a patient. I see the markers on the labs that make me a little nervous. There might be mold, some maybe inflammatory markers, new autoimmune disease, maybe a change in health when they move to a new location you know, the story. And then I'm asking them, and I know this, if I say, do you have mold in your house? 99% of them are going to say, no, there's no mold. Or they might even say, we thought there might be mold because we had this thing happen, leak, whatever. And we had an inspector come and there was, you know, one air sample and it was normal, right? So we know that backstory. And I know often I'll ask much more detailed questions, but tell us why that's often the case and why mold is so often hit. Like let's set the stage of, of why your job and mine too can be so hard because it's not usually that obvious and yet it can be causing a massive problem. Yeah. Can you see the flu? Mm. Can you see COVID? Can you see any of this stuff? No, this is all microscopic stuff that you can't see. Mold and bacteria are not different, right? They're just not a virus. They're mold or bacteria. We breathe it all in the same way. We breathe it all in the same way. So what happens is that people hear mold and, you know, it's funny, like if you search, like literally, if you search COVID, I think all of us now know what that little protein uh -huh. thing looks like. So basically they create an image that you can then associate with whatever it is because people don't understand stuff they can't see. So yeah. a marketing tool, anybody who wants to market something, figure out a way to have somebody visually connect with what you're talking about, and they can now have a better understanding of it because we all rely on our senses to do things, right? That's why the COVID spike thing with like mm -hmm. the orange and purple colors, everybody knows exactly what it looks like, yeah. right? Nobody knew what it looked like before, but everybody knows what it looks like now. So with mold, it's kind of the same thing. Like if you search mold online, what do you see? You see black covering walls. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing, the little COVID guys, are not that big and purple and green flying around here where I can see them. And mold is not covering your walls, but they do that because they're selling mold cleaning products and they're selling this and they're selling your tile mold cleaner and all that stuff. And how do they sell it to you? You have to connect where somebody can see what they're purchasing and they can wrap their head around something they could see better yeah. than a concept that they don't understand. And so that's why people think that mold looks like that. But the reality is this is what mold looks like. There's a little bubbling paint on a wall under a window. Uh, my baseboard, just pulling off the wall a little bit. My floor in front of my dishwasher is like bowed just a little bit. It's like warped a little bit. There's a little stain that's like this big on my ceiling. That's what mold looks like because what mold needs to grow is water. Those are the signs of water damage that we can see. And our eyes can actually see those things. Mm -hmm. We can't see mold. So the way that we go through a house is we understand what water damage looks like and not water right now, Water from 10 years ago that warped your floor can still have a hidden mold problem under there if it wasn't remediated. And that's the big secret to this whole thing is to not actually look for mold when you go into a house, is to look for signs of water damage and ask the right questions to understand what's happened historically to the house as well. You put all that together. It's just like what you do. It's just like what you do. Yeah, gosh, that's a great explanation because it really is most of the time very hidden. And it could be like in the case of your box of mold in the apartment in LA, like you're living in this place that is absolutely exuding mycotoxins. Let's talk a bit about that. There's nothing on the walls, by the way. Right. That room yeah. looks look just like this. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah. That's the thing, right? And what you said, I think is such a great analogy. I've never heard that, but I love the viral flu analogy because these are 2.5 microns and less when you look at viral particles and, my, and microns of mycotoxins. So we have the mold spores, right? They're pretty large. They don't actually go into our bloodstream through our lungs. They're too big. And even our good filtration systems like HEPA, they're going to pull out the, the spores. If there's any spores in the air, those are pretty large. And those are not the dangerous thing. Those are even more visible. The invisible mycotoxins, which is what a mold secretes, which can go right through the wall and can remain after a mold is taken care of or, or cleaned up, right? And those mycotoxins are 2.5 microns or below. And it's the same as the viruses. Literally, the only kind of filtration system that will take that out is a um, VOC filter, which is that carbon or whatever. So with all this invisibleness and the concept, obviously people who listen to my uh, podcast know about mold. A lot of them have suffered from mold. Um, where would you start? Say I have a client who is, you know, I see all these signs and I'm like, call Brian, let's see if we have something in your environment. And they call you and say, Brian, come over, pay to you to inspect and look at this. Well, take us through the house, like with them, how would you walk through and what would you be looking for? 
I mean, before we even show up, we'd have like a 30 to 60 minute conversation before we even show up. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, again, everyone think of this the same way. We're when you go and work with like Dr. Jill and there's like an onboarding form of all of your medical history and there's all this stuff that they, that she needs to know before she could sit down with you and say, okay, here's what I'm kind of seeing to start with. Now tell me what, what's going on with you. And okay, here's what's going on with you. Okay. Here's the test that I think we need to run based on your history and what you're telling me is going on with you. Cool. Then I get the results back from the test. Okay. So here's what we found in the test. We know what's going on now. Here's a plan in a priority form of order of how we attack this problem, right? That's that we do the same exact thing. It's literally the same exact thing, except for inside of a body, it's inside of a house, but a house is a living system, just like a body, right? It's all interconnected. And there's, if something's happening over here, it can have an effect over here the same way in the body. So the first thing is the conversation. What's going on? Why are you even reaching out about this? Right? Mm -hmm. Usually people that get to us are sick. Right. Mm -hmm. Like because yeah. that's the reputation we have. Everybody knows, like, I've been looking for this for five years and can't find it. They'll find it. Right. Yeah. And so that's kind of where it starts. And then we start talking about what kind of what kind of symptoms are there? What's going on? Because the testing panels in terms of what we're doing in the house, it's not like a cut and paste sort of thing. Right. It's what's your symptom set? What's going on? So if you're somebody who's like a multi-system, multi-symptom problem, right? Mm -hmm. I've got, I got symptoms. I've got brain fog and I got skin stuff. And my hair's falling out and my seven-year-old's peeing the bed all of a sudden mm -hmm. randomly. And all of these things are happening. Well, at that point, we know we're expanding our testing panel to look at a larger um, kind of look at water damage toxins and components that could be attributing to that. If you're someone that's way on the other side, like, I don't know, I'm just concerned about it. And I have like a, you know, sniffy nose or whatever, then do you need to do as much? It probably doesn't align with your goals so much, right? So, so it's understanding why you're reaching out. It's understanding what your goals are. And then it's talking about the history of the house. And when I say history of the house, where have there been leaks that you know of, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is the one thing I say to everybody, like, yes. And they always say like the big thing, oh, I had this pipe leak and this one happened. I had this flood. Cool. Tell me all that stuff. I want to know all that stuff. Now that we've done that, tell me all the teeny tiny things that you didn't think were a big deal. Yeah. Well, I had a drip under my sink cabinet uh, and I noticed it after like a, a couple of weeks. And then I just put a bucket under there afterwards. All right. That's a problem, right? Yeah. Because you were dripping into a cabinet for a couple of uh -huh. weeks, right? My kids splash out of the bathtub and like the baseboards near the tub are like a little, you know, they look a little weird and funky. All right, cool. That's water hitting it. The thing, the thing that we do a lot as people is we normalize stuff that happens all the time. Yeah. So instead of us having a unique one-time reaction to something, mm -hmm. if it happens over and over and over again, we kind of numb and dull ourselves to that, right? So our reaction isn't as strong as it would be the first time, mm -hmm. right? That means we start hearing, oh, well, sink, sinks leak. It's mm -hmm. normal, whatever. Kids splash out of the tubs. There's no fixing that. Side note, there is. My kid doesn't splash out of the tub because I taught yeah. her not to splash yeah. out of the tub right? Um, all these areas of like normal water things that happen, we dismiss them because they're normal, but those are the areas we should be most concerned about because there's a higher probability of the water thing happening. Or my college kids takes a shower for an hour and doesn't turn on the exhaust fan and there's condensation, like that's kind of normal. And yet, as we know, especially yeah. in the wall surface and wallpaper, whatever that condensation, um, yeah, a hundred percent. And so to like, to wrap it up, it's like, tell me all of these things. Let me get a list of all these things. So I know certain things just from a history perspective going in that we're going to want to check out. And then we do a deep dive of the house. We're usually at a house, depending on the size, anywhere from like four to eight hours, probably on average, depending on how big it is. Every room, every closet, crawl space, attic, basement, open up every air conditioning system. You have five of them. I guess we're opening them all up. Mm -hmm. you like all of that stuff because it's all connected and it's all part of what's going on. I love uh, that you're describing this because people can realize, and obviously I understand what you do, how thorough it is and how much it takes because you have someone come in who comes in in an hour or two, glances around and then takes an air sample. There's nothing wrong with air samples. It's one piece of data. It's a good piece of data, but as you and I know, it can miss things just like any, any test that we're using can miss things. But I want to say this because I have a lot of patients who come in I am sure from the labs, there's some mold somewhere. And they said, oh, we had a mold inspector. Oh, we had two or three mold inspectors and everything was fine. I get that so often. So I want to kind of differentiate the kind of work you do and people who really know what they're doing in the inspection world versus someone who um, 
maybe has the base and really tell me this too, with the, with this industry, I understand there's not as much regulation, so you don't always know what kind of uh, inspector, the qualifications, is that true? Am I saying it's that? It's totally true. It's, it's actually, the whole thing is just kind of ridiculous, like from top to bottom. Yeah. They're state licenses. The states don't even care if you're certified. They just, so the, so it's a money grab by the states wow. to get you to just pay a license. Like, so if you wanted to be licensed in like New York or Florida or Texas or something, you just have to jump through a couple of hoops and get your license. It has nothing to do with if you actually know what you're doing. And there's separate certifications that are specific to our industry. That's not a state license yeah. that are at least teach you a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't even require that. So like the, the state licensing thing, it doesn't really mean a whole lot other than somebody went through and did it. And then our industry certifications, it's all based on stuff that was written like 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, imagine like in your field, if you just stopped learning 20 years ago, like mm -hmm. you wouldn't even be doing what you're doing right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, do, yeah. Right? You wouldn't acknowledge mold exists probably. I know. <laughs> Let alone so that. it's really tough and it's hard. And I understand it's hard because if I'm somebody who's out there, it's like, well, then how do I find somebody, right? If I can't look... Because the, the through line is like, are they certified with a particular certification? I look at the site. It means that they have two years or eight years and they know X, Y, or Z or whatever. The problem is it's not hard to get any certification. I actually stopped getting certifications because they mean absolutely nothing. And I don't want to waste my time because I had other stuff to do. Yeah. So like I have, you know, I have, but like I, there are people who are like loaded with certifications and it's just kind of funny to me. Like, I just don't really understand the point of it. Unless your job is, I'm going to go out and be a legal expert. And so I need all the certifications to be an expert witness, right? Like that's, that's the deal. The thing, the thing to keep in mind, and you're saying it too. So mo the story that you told is a story that happens all the time. And I see all the time too. So doctor tells someone that they're sick. They're like, first off, someone's sick. Doctor doesn't get it. Takes them two years, five years, 10 years to find the doctor. That's like, okay. Here's what's going on. It's a mold thing. So however long that took for you to get there, let's assume you just started today and you found, found you, right? Cool. Got a mold thing going on. So then what do you do? So then you go out and you look, where do you go to look for anything? You go to Yelp, you go to wherever, because that's where you look to find stuff. Hey, this guy's got five stars. Call him up. Oh yeah. It's, you know, it's $800. We include three samples. We come out, we do this, we give you cool. So they come out and they do exactly what you said. This is what happened in my apartment. They come out, they do two samples. You do one outside, they do one in one room. Maybe you're yeah. lucky they do one or two in another room if you're lucky or whatever. And then they come back and those samples pretty much always say, there's no problem. Why do they say there's no problem? Because air samples are a good tool if they're used in the right way. You should pretty much never use an air sample in the middle of a room for an air quality test. It is not what it is good at doing, right? So... What it is good at doing is knowing, is there a hidden problem behind the wall that's not visible? And can I put a tube through this wall and collect air from behind the wall right where I think the problem is? Yeah. So air samples, the further away you get from source, like exponentially less effective they are and accurate they are. So like we, I did an internal study for like a year on this. I won't go through the ins and outs of it, but like if I thought there was mold in this wall, I would then come over here and take an air sample three feet away. 70% of the time that sample gave a false negative when there was a problem right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first off, if anyone's watching, like I've had somebody come in and they did air samples, they did everything was fine. I'm sorry, but that kind of doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like a mold inspector should inspect something for the love of it. Like yeah. maybe just go out there and try a little bit. Like when these guys come in, they're like air sample, air sample, air sample. And I'm out in 45 minutes or an hour. Where did you look? And if that sample came back and said there was a problem, let's say it did, let's say it was a 30% of the time where it did show something that was there, then what's the answer? Right. Where did it come from? What do you do? They'll give you one of two answers. One, gut your entire room because I have no idea where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Or two, I have a magic fog that just gets rid of everything and then it'll never be a problem again. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work either, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to find source, you have to find root cause, you have to know where it's coming from, or else it's going to keep coming and keep coming It's relentless and it's just going to keep beating the hell out of you. It's like if you walked into a house and some dude punched you in the face, would you just keep walking in the house and letting him punch you in the face? Like, no, you'd be like, yo, get this dude out of my house. So I stop getting punched in the face. Like, that's what's happening to you guys, right? And so that's what we're trying to figure out. And that's kind of the difference in the approach, like top to bottom. Yeah. And I hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, 
Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. It's like top to bottom. Yeah. And I love the real key there is even I am not the expert and I will always admit that, but I know just enough to ask some of the right questions. Or if I was walking outside, no, um, the kinds of places, or even my own place, right. The places to look. And I, again, I'm an, a novice. I am not the expert, but that inspection, the actual looking at under sinks in bathrooms, crawl spaces. I've done that. If I've looked at homes to buy, I'd had someone come in and go into the crawl space and look at those places because the visual inspection with, is, which is what you're saying is really the core of finding the root. And you can still be human and miss those things, but there's no inspection without a really good, knowledgeable visual inspection. And like you said, just to reiterate, a lot of times there's these spores and things contained behind the walls. And you and I know the really toxic black molds, they love a water source and they love to stay put under floorboards behind walls. It is extremely rare to get stachybotrys or cotomium in air samples, unless you have post hurricane, you know, completely flooded home that's filled with with those things. So it's actually even more concerning because the really toxic molds that are causing the neurological immune issues are even less likely to be in the air samples. Um, so, so obviously there's air sampling. There's, I still like the uh, qPCR because I feel like sometimes it gives a historical, is that something you typically do as part of the inspection? Absolutely. So I'll kind of walk you through. So there's, there's basically two goals of an inspection. First one is figure out where source is. Second one is to figure out how the source has kind of migrated into the living space, which is what you're breathing, right? So imagine factory, factory is the source. Smoke coming out of the factory, that's the cross-contamination. If you live in a house over here, somebody might tell you like, oh, you live in a place with a pollution problem. You're breathing all the smoke from this factory. I live in a place with a factory problem. That's my problem. My problem is a factory and this is, but this is the direct impact on me from the factory. You have to address both things. You can't only go after the smoke because more smoke will come. Mm -hmm. You can't only go after the factory because the smoke is still there and you're still going to breathe it. So you have to go after both things. So from a source perspective, we talk targeted air samples, right? So I, I probably bash air samples all the time because most people use them incorrectly. If you're using them properly, they're one of the best tools that you can have. But you just I agree. And I love that you said that. So we are real clear. They can be very, very appropriate. It's just knowing like you do how to use them appropriately. And we use them in every single inspection, but they're mm -hmm. never just sitting in the middle of a room. They're mm -hmm. in an isolated cabinet. They're in a wall. They're in. A, I mean, it's just it, it's just yeah. targeting as close as you can. So. That's why I always call them targeted or source air samples. And I always differentiate them like an ambient middle of room sample from like a source targeted air sample. They're different. So you have one of those or you have some sort of surface testing, right? Mm -hmm. There's something you think is something going on. You, you swab it, you tape it, whatever you do. That's your source ID. Those are literally the only two things you do for source identification. That's it. You figure out if there's a problem there. Now, the next piece is how is the smoke coming out of these factories and moving through your house? So if you think of your house, your house kind of has three levels of the house. Top level is your heating air conditioning system, okay? Your heating air conditioning system is like the lungs of your house. It sucks air in from the house and then it breathes it out everywhere else, except of having one mouth that has like 50 mouths for all the vents and everything, right? So it's sucking everything in and spreading it out. Your air conditioning system can either be its own source mm -hmm. or it could become cross-contaminated and just start spreading stuff around all over the place. It could be either one. It just depends how impacted it is. So you have that. Your second level of your house is all your structural surfaces, walls, ceilings, floors, cabinets, all that stuff. That's where the sources are, right? And then the third level of the house is the settlement that comes down onto all the surfaces in the house. So think about it. You sit down on your chair, you bump your desk, you do whatever. You're popping up little particles constantly up in your breathing zone. This is called the personal cloud effect. There's research papers. There's, there's literally home science papers on this stuff. Yeah. This is how you get exposed to things, okay? So you have all three levels of the house. That means that in a proper inspection and remediation plan, 
you have to address all three levels of the house if the goal is to not be exposed to it anymore, right? So that's the idea. So when we're talking about air conditioning system and settlement in the house, that's where you get into dust testing. That's where the research papers are I'm talking about. And basically what it's saying is as you move around the house, we were watching Charlie Brown and that little kid pig pen with the dirt around him all the time. It followed him everywhere. That happens to every single one of you walking through your house, except instead of dirt, it's invisible particles that are following you. And that's what you're breathing over and over and over. So dust collection is the best way to get your eyes on that. PCR for mold, it shows you not only the spores, right? We just talked about the spores are bigger, right? But the spores are not really the problem. Mm -hmm. It's the tiny particles and fragments that break off the colonies. And why are they the problem? Because our filtration system in our body that's meant to protect our lungs can't protect against particles that are that small. It's like a net, right? And the particles go right through the net, whoop, right through the net, right? And they go right into the lungs and that's where it can get into the bloodstream. So PCR picks up on anything with the DNA signature, which includes the little particles. And it doesn't matter if they're alive or dead to trigger the immune response. Absolutely. So the question of like, oh, well, is it alive or dead? Who cares? Most of the stuff in the house is actually dead or dormant. And you know what? Everyone is still reacting to it. So that's the deal. So PCR there, then you can also do like chemical analysis on dust too for mycotoxins or bacterial toxins, stuff like that. And that's how you build out the plan. Oh, fantastic. And I love that you said that you were the one who originally, I think we talked about this before, we talked the dried flower arrangement, <laughs> you know, like where you, you disturb this stuff and you, you'd flick it or blow on it, you'd fragment it. And those fragments, I just want to reiterate, because you said this, but for patients that are suffering from mold related illness, those fragments of dead, dried old mold will still trigger immune inflammatory response, which is why you do this inspection, you find the source and that's your factory analogy. But then whatever was there in the environment, in your HVAC system, in your air conditioning system, or your heating system, or just the dust in your home, if you don't take care of that after the remediation, people still don't get well. And, and that's part of the process as well. And then they think that it didn't work. This is the problem. This is why if you're one of the hundreds of thousand people in the SIRS and toxic mold line group, this and the Lyme and mold in this Facebook group, that and all the groups with all the mold stuff, and they all say, it's impossible. You have to live in the woods. I, I have to live in a trailer. It's not impossible. There's three things you need to do in a house. And if you don't do all three of them, it doesn't work. You're going to walk in and feel exactly the same. If you only handle the sources and you left the settled stuff in the house and the air conditioning system, you walk in, the smoke is still there. If you only did one or the other, this is why. Remediation only doesn't work for two reasons. One, you didn't find the sources and two, you just didn't clean it all up right. Yeah. It, no, works. I, it works I, all I, the time because I see it work all the time. Yeah. So for all of you who are feeling like um, kind of down and like, and what sort of like hopeless and defeated. Like, yeah, <laughs> defeated, it's not that it doesn't work. See, we feel like that because we think we don't understand why it's not working. It's just like, oh, it can't ever work. I'm telling you, this is why it doesn't work, which means if you actually do it the right way, it does work. We just yeah. weren't doing it the right way. Gosh, I couldn't agree more. And I want to also reiterate something you said earlier that I think is a big misnomer. Someone comes in and said, oh, we'll just fog and clear it out. That will take care of that dust, the pig pen effect temporarily. It will not get to the root. And it might, what, why it's probably felt like it's worked is people feel better temporarily because that dust burden and the particulate in their environment is a little bit better for maybe a month, maybe a few weeks, yeah. right? And, but it all comes back if you haven't gotten to the source. That's um, always the timeline. Yeah. It's like a month or two later. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing is that they're going to tell you, and remember it said alive or dead doesn't matter. So like dig into that a little bit more. First off, let's, let's pretend that it killed everything. Cool. It doesn't matter. It's all still there. They didn't, they didn't remove it. It's right. all still there. Right now. The second thing, mycotoxins are not alive. They are a chemical. Mm -hmm. So there's this magic fog. Don't let anyone sell you on this magic fog. That's going to get rid of your mold. And it's also going to somehow denature a chemical compound because it apparently does all of those things. And it's going to somehow get behind your walls and get in there and do all that too and make it all just disappear into nothingness. It doesn't exist. It yeah. doesn't exist. I love that we're talking about this because this is a common theme. And I want to say there is one caveat to that. If you are really suffering, you can't move. You have a landlord, you're stuck. You don't know the source. You don't have time and you fog. You can temporarily buy some time. That isn't about it. It's cost a lot of money, but say you fog and do a small particulate cleaning. You haven't found the source. You will feel better for a few months. So in the, again, it's money, but if you have the resources and you don't have an option to leave or, or remediate immediately, it could buy you time. 
but it is not getting to the root problem. So love that you said that. Um, interesting. I want to talk the pig pen thing back in my original experience with mold exposure. My contractor brilliantly put this 1970s building. He remodeled my office and there's this old, horrible carpet, probably full of toxins and molds and things. And my office was um, remodeled right over an unfinished crawl space that had standing water, didn't know any of this, but they put a beautiful new bamboo floor right over that carpet instead of tearing it up and creating. And so can you imagine I'm walking every step, bamboo is very soft wood. So every step as I got sicker and sicker and there turned out to be a massive mold issue, I was walking on this soft bamboo flooring that was put over this 20 year old carpet. Can you imagine how, I mean, it was just toxic, but I, I laugh now because now that I know I'm like, how crazy is that? <laughs> The shortcuts that happen, I mean, it's not just in one industry, every industry, I'm sure your industry does, my industry does, yeah. guys who, who do bug stuff, like our, I had a whole podcast on the guy who was doing my like insect whatever in the backyard, uh -huh. and I was so upset because all he did was spray, and then I go and I look under like these light canisters and I see all the spider eggs, like sacks. Uh, you're like, uh, it's the same thing. I yeah. sprayed instead of finding the source. You know what's going to happen? All these freaking spiders are going to break out and be everywhere because you didn't actually go figure out where they were coming from. It happens in every single industry. It does. And it's the same here, right? There's got, you yeah. know, you have rheumatoid arthritis. Here's methyltrexate. That'll cover up your symptoms, but it doesn't go to the root of why do you have arthritis in the first place? Um, oh my gosh. I always love talking to you, Brian. And it, the time goes like this. Um, one last thing I want to just talk about is uh, what's, there's a couple myths. I want to be a myth buster today. New homes, multi-million dollar homes. You know, people are like, oh, well, I bought this really expensive home or my home is brand new, or I bought into a, a new condo that's brandly built. How often are you seeing mold issues in new builds and newer buildings compared to older structures? Like what's the, the, the thoughts on that? Because obviously no place is, yeah. is perfectly safe. It's tough because when you get into this, then the reaction from somebody listening to it says, there's no hope anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we're back to the trailer in the woods, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I want to talk about it carefully. Like the point of these conversations, I know I get like really excited. This doesn't work. This does work. And sometimes people are like, oh, Brian, just like, it's like, mm -hmm. he doesn't help. He just says what doesn't happen, what doesn't happen. The point is to let us understand what the reality is. So then we can start making decisions based off of like the truth of how it works instead of not, right? So with new homes, first off, any home can have a mold problem, mm -hmm. okay? Any home can have a mold problem. Now, the nice thing, let's talk pros and cons of new homes. That way it's not just all like negative. Mm -hmm. Pros and cons, no history, okay? Mm -hmm. So the, the dishwasher that flooded 40 years ago when grandma lived in the house that wasn't properly handled, that can ha have happened, right? The more history a house has, the more improperly handled water events are now ingrained in the house and you inherit that when you get that house, mm -hmm. right? So that's a, that's a pro on the new house side, right? Is that you're not a, inheriting all this stuff that happened before, right? That went on with that, okay? Um, on the downside, outside of the mold front, there's a lot of new building materials in there. There's chemical off-gassing. There's kind of like the other thing that you sort of have to deal with on that side. So some people are have mold triggers, but they haven't gotten all the way to the point where they're chemical sensitive yet. And so maybe that's okay. And they can deal with that because they're not so far down. Other people have triggered MCS and a host of other things off the end of, of being ha having mold issues. And so then the new house can't really work for them either because of all the off-gassing. But the other thing with new homes is the way the homes are built. And I, I literally am just talked to a client today. I'm going to their house tomorrow. And their house, when it was built, the roof took two months to close the house. Yeah. And it snowed and rained into the house, who knows how long. And they were pushing it out with push brooms out of the inside of their house. Yeah. And now we're wondering why the kids and yeah. everyone else in there are having all of these problems, right? And they were told, oh, this isn't an issue. This isn't an issue. We've had multiple inspectors. This isn't an issue, right? So in the build, your house isn't always sealed and covered, right? Right. right? So there could be elements that happen at the mm -hmm. time and it rains in and it causes a problem. That could be one thing. The other thing is the lumber and stuff that's being used is stored. If you ever go drive by a site, it's literally just sitting in the dirt outside. Yeah. Where do yeah. you think mold grows? Like that's where it starts. Then they take the wood up and there's mold on the wood and they build with it. So if you're able to, if you're like involved in the process from start to finish and you can kind of see it all happening, you could try to insert a space in the middle 
where before they close with drywall, you come and just have the whole thing remediated, right? Mm -hmm. And you can actually get off the studs and off of everything. You can get all the mold and everything treated and off of there. And then when you close, you don't have anything back there and you're starting from a clean slate, right? Now, let's say you're going into a house where you don't have that ability. It's a track place, or maybe it's like two years old or something, or they just built it and it's fully built. And now you're ready to move in and you can't see it. So there's a couple of little tricks that you can do to get a feel for like the type of wood that was used and maybe some of the elements might have happened. Keep in mind, like you can't know everything, right? But if there's an attic, go in the attic, look at the wood up there. Is there mold all over a lot of the wood? They use the same wood to build your whole house. Mm -hmm. So if you go up there and you see number of areas that's like a significant mold issue, you could kind of assume they're using the same wood to build the rest of the place. Like for me, I'm out of that place. Like, no, show me another one. Show me another one. Let me go up and look at another one. Um, and then if you are going to go into a place, you can run, you can run a dust test mm -hmm. and you can see what the load of mold is in there. Right. So when they're building, what are they doing? They're disturbing, they're hammering, they're pounding, they're doing this. So if there's mold on the framing, on the building material and all this stuff, it's going to get out just like the smoke off the sources. Yeah. Right. And then nobody find particle cleans a house before they give it to you. They cosmetically clean a house. Right. right? Which means all the, all that stuff is still in there. So even if you move in a new house, you absolutely should be doing a fine particle clean. If you're somebody who's definitely for somebody who's sensitive, you should be doing that. But you could do you could do a dust test in there and you can see like how bad the load is. You can even test for mycotoxin. You could do the whole thing yeah. in there if you want to. And the other big thing that you have to be careful of in new homes is the air conditioning systems. Mm -hmm. So they run the air conditioning systems in the houses because the workers get hot. Yeah. They're running the air conditioning system while all the walls are exposed and they're banging all the stuff that we just talked about and it goes in the air conditioning system. So I had a client years ago, they a $5 million house, some nice house in LA that I went up in the hills somewhere to this house. Beautiful house. Didn't find one thing that looked like a source anywhere in the house. Get in the attic. They're stuck in the attic. Like I just talked about. They have three air conditioning units. Every unit lives in the attic and the units. I tested all three of the units through dust testing on the interior of the units, tested the attic, you know, framing and stuff that was in there. Every unit, every air conditioning unit was, was heavily contaminated. Wow. Mold issues. wow. So it doesn't mean you can't avoid it. It's, it, mm -hmm. ju or it just means that you have to know what to look for and like what to test and what to do before you get into a multi hundred thousand dollar million dollar thing. Because once you're in, you're like, ah, oh, now yeah. I have all this money in here. Like, and then you move all your things in. And if it really is contaminated, yeah. I love that you said that because my thought now is I'm in this condo and I love it. As someday I may move to a home because um, multi-level, just like my, I don't know if I, I don't think I mentioned here, but I've mentioned before last summer, my neighbor above had a fridge leak, went down into my condo. And of course I had no control over that. Kind of like your landlord, uh, LA apartment. Um, but I wanted to say, as I'm looking for homes in the future, I have decided there's probably going to be some issue in almost anything I want to buy. So it's what am I willing to risk and take care of? So I'm going into it actually as someone who's mold sensitive, knowing no matter what house I want to purchase, I just have to find out, is this something I'm willing to deal with? Because there's probably going to be some pieces of remediation and even a new build, like you said, that I'm going to do. So I actually like to empower people that way. Cause like you said, it can be really discouraging. If you're mold sensitive, you just have to know you're in this environment. Number one, if you listen to some of the other podcasts, we can build resilience so that you aren't as sensitive. That's a whole nother topic. But number two, like you said, Brian, you can go in with a mindset of, okay, I need to find all the issues. And then what am I willing to pay for or, or remediate or deal with? And there's some big issues like foundational issues I wouldn't mess with. Um, some pump, maybe, maybe not, but um, maybe a a window that needs replacing easy, right? And fix the fogging the house. So I like thinking yeah. about it as you're probably going to run into something and what am I willing to deal with? Can I give a quick game plan on how to do that? Please. <laughs> okay. So I, I used to work with a lot of people when they were looking for new homes, when I only worked in LA. So I was able to do that. Um, and had this one particular client, like she, we ended up looking at 12 different homes. She was really sick, the whole thing. We looked at 12 different places. She ended up was she was just so discouraged at the end of it. It took like a year and a half or whatever to like look at all this stuff that she ended up buying like the worst place. Oh. And then she gutted the whole thing. Uh -huh. like, I'm over it. I'm buying the worst one that I can get the best deal. And I'm just gutting the entire thing. And we're remediating and starting from scratch. 
Now that's not the point of the story. Not everybody can do that. Yeah. But the point of the story is what I learned going through all the houses with her on how to identify stuff to save her money. Uh -huh. Because when it started, I was going through it the same way I would go through like a house that somebody lived in, right? Yeah. We got to test all the sources. We got to know where everything is because you need to know what you're in for. We got to do the, we got to do all these things because you have to know what you're in for before you commit, you know, in LA, it's like a million dollars, right? And there was validity to that, right? Like, it's like, you need to know what you're in for, but there's a way to phase into knowing what you're in for that I learned on like house three or four throughout this process. So the first thing is you do it, you do a straight visual. And I've done this for multiple people since then you do a straight visual. And if, first off, you inspect your own house, you have to do this. If you're looking for a new house, you have to inspect your own house. Why do you have to do this? You have to know how bad it is where you are. Okay. Because what you said is true. Everywhere is going to have a problem. So if you're leaving and you're saying, oh, I'm just going to go find another place, but we know every place has a problem. Well, how bad was your place? Is the problem you're moving into the same level of problem? Right. Is right. it worse? Is it not? Yeah. So you have to know where you are right now and you have to know how bad it is. Okay. This is your starting point. Your goal is to not make a lateral move. Right. Your goal is to make a better move. That's the goal, right? So then you, you go through the house. So let's say you go through and inspect your house. You say, I had nine source areas of problems that were found. St. Cabinet, this, that, whatever it was. There was nine factories that were found. Mm -hmm. Plus you have an idea of what the dust stuff is and what your exposure looks like, right? Like, okay, here's my starting point. You go start looking at houses. First thing you do is a visual. You learn what water damage looks like, which we can teach you how to do, right? So you learn what water damage looks like. You go through the house. All you need is a flashlight. You need nothing else. Literally all you need. And you could screen out houses just from looking at them if you know what to look for and where to look for it, which is not, it's really not that hard once you know what to look for. I've literally taught people in Japan how to do this and they've done it and found like 30 things in their house. It's not hard to do. If you see more than the nine things, leave. Cool. I'm out. I didn't have to spend a dollar on testing this house because the first thing I did was I looked and I learned what to look for and I got empowered and I figured it out. Right. So now let's say you go through a house and you go through six, seven houses. They all have seven, eight, nine things. Seven isn't good enough. If you were at nine and seven is the answer, it's not good enough. Like it better. Five, three, four, five. That's what you're looking for. Right. So you finally find a place you go through, you say, okay, there's a few things here. Keep in mind, you're probably at minimum always going to find somewhere between three to five things in a house. Mm -hmm. It's probably not going to be any less than that. So you say, okay, cool. So now I know what this is. So now the next question you ask yourself, I could turn this into like a training or a download or something. Yeah, I know. <laughs> thing you ask yourself, what areas are the areas with water damage? Just before you test anything, you're still just looking at it. Okay. What areas are they? Are they isolated areas or are they areas that look systemic and massive impacting? Because that's cost to fix it. Is it a sink cabinet? That's an easy fix. Is it the ceiling below an air conditioning unit? That's a massive problem, right? So not each single water damage thing is equal in right. terms of the cost to fix it, right? So that's the next thing. So then you look at it before you test anything, say, okay, could I handle remediating these five things if they were all bad? Yeah, cool. Okay, next step. I'm gonna do an erm or I'm gonna do a dust test in the house and I'm gonna test the air conditioning system. Brilliant. Okay? Dust test in the house shows you how much, because you might not have found all of them, right? Let's mm -hmm. say you didn't find all the spots, right? So the dust test in the house is going to give you the overall load of everything that's been in that house that you're going to be exposed to, right? You need to have done a dust test in your own house so you can get a yeah. comparison, right? This is the point, mm -hmm. right? So you see it. So you do that. You do the same thing with the with the air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. Is it is it really bad contaminated? If it is, you're looking 20, 30 grand to replace the entire air conditioning system. Know that. Is that feasible? Yeah. Is it not feasible? If not, walk. If you find mycotoxins in any of them, walk. Right. Mm -hmm. So like you ease into the testing, you do visual first, then you just mm -hmm. basic screen testing before. Mm -hmm. Now, if the screen tests come back and they're good, they're like, okay, no mycotoxins. Sure, there's some mold, but that's going to be everywhere. I can deal with this. There's only four sources. This isn't super bad. Then you go in and you do the whole, and you do all the source testing in the house. And in between here, you place your offer on the house, right? You do the visual. If the visual looks good, put the offer in, do yeah. it right there. And then you have a contingency that's anywhere from 10 to 14 days. Mm -hmm. And then each day you do your dust testing right away. You send it out. It takes seven days to get that. You'll get those results back before your contingency is up. Mm -hmm. Everyone, if you don't know this, you can get 100% of your money back if you back out for any reason within your contingency period. 
You could back out because you said you saw ghosts in there and it doesn't matter. They'll give you all of your money back. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to lock it down and then you systemically work through the testing flow all the way through. And then the nice little kicker on this is if you do find, which you will, if yeah. you do find a mold elevation in a dust test, right? It's always going to be there. It's just a matter of how much. Then you go back to the seller and you say, hey, listen, I really like this place. You're already in the deal with them now. Yeah. You're already in the deal. They want the deal to go through. There's no other offer sitting here, right? They want the deal to go through with you. Say, hey, I really like this place. I have a mold allergy. Use use fr phrases that people can relate to, right? Don't yeah. say I have toxic mold syndrome. Right. right? Like, what is that? <laughs> say, I'm a little allergic to mold. And I see that there's some here. So I just love to get like a, like maybe some testing. Can we extend this for like five days? Mm -hmm. They'll all say yes. They want yeah. to close the deal. Then you source test everything, mm -hmm. figure out how bad it is. Then you go back to them because now you have testing data tied to the house that they have to disclose mm -hmm. to whoever's coming in next. Now you say, listen, there's sources here. There's this. I like this place. I'm willing to do it. I need X amount of a credit in order to do it. Or by the way, if I walk away, you now have to disclose all of these problems that I found to the next person that comes in. You have leverage, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just about easing into it and like taking the leverage and manipulating the system in your benefit. So this has been a training I've been wanting to do for a long time. Oh, so this, Brian, this is pearls of such great wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, oh my goodness, this is so great. I know if you're listening out there, this is such valuable information because no one's talking about it. One last little clarifying question. You talked about air conditioning. You're in all places you're going, you're doing that. Are you doing, are you cutting out a piece of the filter? Are you doing a PCR? What are you doing with the units of air conditioning to test? So if we're going in, we're going to where the actual unit is and we're mm -hmm. opening it yeah. where like the fan, the blower mm -hmm. fan is, it spins yeah. around where the coil is in there. And we're actually in there testing. Okay. Are you it's doing like an air sample in there? Like in the, like intricate, no, or a what no, kind we're doing of, all, we're doing dust testing. In there. Got it. Perfect. That Most makes... systems don't have mold growing in them. Some yeah. of them, if they do, you swab it, you take it. Mm -hmm. you do what you right. Do. Most of them don't have mold. Most of them just look a little dirty. Yes, it's the composition of the dust. The Got it. Okay. Dust. I just want to make sure that it was clear because I admit that's a really, really wise thing. Um, oh my goodness. As always, you were uh, full of such great information. So people are dying to know where are they going to find you? You've got some things coming out. Tell us a little about what you're working on. Cause I always love, I just want to say to those listening, Brian is brilliant. And I love that you're helping us as doctors in this industry, because you're making our job easier to help heal the patients. And what I love that you're doing is you're constantly getting, how can people themselves be more empowered? You've got lots of things going on. So tell us about that. Yeah. So, I mean, our, if you want us to come to your house, we can, that's what that's, we do that all over the country. That's what we do. Um, yes. We inspect.com. That's our website. You can get a free phone console. Just click the button so that that's what it is. So as far as like what's going on. So we have, we have two services out now and within about a month, or so the third one is we're, we're testing it right now. I'm super pumped about it. It will be out. Me too. <laughs> I know. First, we'll we'll literally go anywhere. We fly all over the country. I have inspectors strategically placed in different cities in the country to make travel easy. Big question comes up: Are you outsourcing your inspectors? No, I literally am training all of them myself. They understand our flow, our sequence. It's all under our umbrella. Um, so that's that's one thing. A couple of years ago, I created a program called Mold Finders Method. This is a training program. It was a 100% training program to teach people how to go through and find all of these things on their own, like I mentioned. In there, it tells you about what are the five signs of, of water damage? Where do you look for them in every room? This core program is what people on six different continents have used to find all kinds of problems in their houses. So, and it's we're not coming there, right? It's a DIY program, right? So it's kind of like you do it on your own, but it's an entire training program. You can do it. And it's like so much more affordable than like having somebody come out. The downside is we're not there. There's no consulting back and forth, you know, all of it, right? So there's a balance in between. Well, in the meantime, I've been trying to figure out how to make some sort of hybrid version of that. So two years ago at our company meeting, I put out that our goal was to be able to service every provide a service and help every single person, no matter where they live in the world and no matter how much money they have. Mm -hmm. And that has been something we've been working for for a couple of years, right? Now, you know, our company has been, so, you know, we're not, we're not cheap to fly somewhere and do all the testing you need, right? And sometimes it discourages people and I get that, but you shouldn't have to be independently wealthy 
or happen to live in a location where you just have more options. Like, what if I live in the middle of Idaho? Like, right. why can't I get help? Right. And so that that's what we've been working on. So basically what we've been doing is we we built out our entire framework for how you go through every single room of your house. Core was built off the Mole Finders Method Training Program. And then we merged in a lot of the stuff that we do in person as well. Mm -hmm. And we put it together in an app that goes on your phone. Yeah. And the way that it works is, you know, if you're concerned about certain areas or whatever's going on, you can literally room by room, it will show you exactly what, what pictures we need to see. So the nice thing about this is you don't have to learn how to look for anything. Right. Both Hunters Method was a training program. You had to put some time in, put some sweat equity in, but if you did it, it really worked. This is, can you take a picture of this, 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 and this? Are you capable of doing that on your phone? You are awesome. Do that, send it in, and we will look at it and tell you where the problems are, right? And that's what the new, that's what's coming out in like a month. We've been working on it for two years. And it's, I mean, frankly, it's going to change the entire industry. And also, frankly, uh, a lot of people are going to be pretty pissed off that we have it offered. And there's going to be a lot of that happening out there. But I kind of don't care because it's not about what our industry thinks about us. It's about what we can do to provide access and knowledge and price availability to everybody at wherever they are in their stage. So now think that you're a renter who is concerned about like one or two rooms. You want us to look at your house, but it doesn't make sense to fly us out to your house to inspect a place that you don't own, right? Mm -hmm. And spend that kind of money. Now there's going to be an app where you can just inspect two rooms and it's going to be a fraction of the cost, right? So there's all these different um, ways that it's going to work. But no matter where you are and what your goals are, and this is why we have to have these conversations up front yeah. on what you're looking to achieve and what it is, that we have something that's going to work. And, and it's all based in the same process of find the problem, validate the problem, yeah. remove the sources, clean up the mess they made. Uh, wow. I love it, Brian. And so grateful that years ago, I'm sorry that you had this experience in LA, but what a blessing you have been to practitioners like myself, patients that are listening and so many people, and this will impact the world. It's always why I love talking to you. And I want to say to your analogies of how you describe are so helpful because a lot of this invisible stuff, people are overwhelmed and they don't get it. And you do a great job of making complex things simple. Um, Thank you, as always, for being here. Thank you for joining me today. I will be sure and link up with Yes, We Inspect That Common, everything that's coming out um, wherever you're watching this podcast or listening. Thank you, everyone. Sorry I talked for so long, but thank you. It was awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>